Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome to our second uh, webinar for our Sleep Management Awareness Month. Uh, my name is Kim Sager, and I am going to be hosting the webinar today um, and introducing our speaker, Mr. Kent Carneal. Um, before we get started, uh, there's a few administrative things I'd like to go over. Um, just so everybody is aware, this is being recorded. Uh, we will post it up on our MPMA uh, YouTube account um, later in the month, um, but just so everybody's aware. Um, also, everybody is on mute, so if you have a question, um, please go ahead and type it into the box. We will hopefully have time at the end uh, to answer some of those questions. Um, so go ahead and do that, and then we can see that and uh, help get your questions answered. So today, um, the presentation um, is going to be by, again, Mr. Kent Carneal. Um, it's titled Federal Fleet Data and Performance Metrics. Um, a little bit about Kent. Kent is a senior consultant at Mercury Associates, which is the largest dedicated fleet management consulting firm in the world. Kent currently supports the Department of State's overseas fleet program. And is the federal uh, and is a certified federal fleet manager through the MPMA Federal Fleet Training and Certification Program. So, welcome, Kent. Good afternoon here from the East Coast. Thank you. And uh, we whenever will you're get ready, started. Kent. Yeah, we'll we'll go ahead and get started. This um, presentation was developed for the 2018 National Education Seminar. Uh, in August of last year. That's why you see the 2018 NES uh, at the bottom of the screen. That's on all the slides. But uh, it's been popular. This will be my third time um, presenting this information. Uh, there is a lot of content, uh, so I, I will be moving through it fairly quickly. I uh, do, when I write a presentation, I try to uh, uh, at least think of what questions folks might ask and, and put that content in. So I'm hoping we won't have a whole lot of questions. Um, we'll probably take a, a just a very, very you know few seconds break before we head into the metrics portion of it to see if anybody has any questions about the vehicle level data section uh, and then move on to the end where we'll again attend to any questions anybody has. Okay, Kim, if you want to go ahead to the next slide. So the, the basis of federal fleet reporting, uh, it really comes out of uh, the Code of Federal Regulations. The GSA is, is required, according to U.S. Code, to produce annually a federal fleet report. And at the same time, agencies are required to submit fleet information through the Federal Automotive Statistical Tool, or FAST, as I will refer to it. Um, also, Executive Order 13693, Planning for Federal Sustainability in the Next Decade, requires agencies to report complete and accurate vehicle level data uh, in, in FAST. Now, EO 13693 was rescinded by a recent uh, executive order from the Trump administration, but the guidance for that uh, EO 13834 is not out yet. Um, therefore, the, the guidance for the previous executive order still stands until the new guidance comes. We're uh, waiting for that, hoping to see it soon. Next slide, please. So the, the vehicle level data is uh, reporting is, is quite different essentially from the way vehicle level or vehicle information was reported in FAST prior to this. In, the earlier version, so to speak, of FAST, agencies would report groups of vehicles. They would roll up their information into statistical groups of different types of vehicles, and uh, they would report inventory, their acquisitions, their disposals, their um, uh, domestic fleet, their foreign fleet, all of those in separate uh, loads, essentially, into the system, where vehicle-level data is uh, 
more of a, a, a broad spreadsheet uh, containing a lot of information. And here you see that information depicted as cost and use data. There are eight different attributes for that, 15 attributes directly related to the vehicle, four for the fleet, and five for ownership data, fuel related to specifically to the um, six fields related specifically to fuel data used by each vehicle, and then eight special characteristics, which are generally emissions related. So there are 46 data elements defined, and uh, as many of them as 40 are required at, in some particular situations, not all of them all the time, but uh, it's a significant number of attributes that have to be reported. Next slide, please. The VLD now, in comparison to the old way of reporting, requires some new information, um, new in the sense that it has to be reported where it wasn't before. Certainly a make model and model year are not new for most agencies to capture that information and use it. Uh, gross vehicle weight, some agencies may or may not have had that. Vehicle assignment type is um, probably new for everybody. Uh, that's whether the vehicle is pooled or shared or dedicated to an individual and so on. A disposal reason, accident repair costs are now reported separately. A fuel type configuration uh, is probably a new field for most everyone. And just so um, folks will understand, there's uh, a fuel type field and a fuel type configuration field. The configuration field is defines or enumerates how a vehicle is configured, what type of fuel is it supposed to, to use, or fuels in the case of a flex fuel or biofuel vehicle. So uh, a flex fuel vehicle, like say a Chevy Tahoe, can use gasoline or E85, ethanol. So its fuel type configuration would be gas slash E85 flex fuel, uh, whereas a, a vehicle that is not flex fuel would be designed only to use gasoline or diesel fuel or what have you. So that configuration is talking about what, how is the vehicle designed to, to consume fuel and what fuels can it consume. The fuel type only, fuel type field is used in reporting what fuel was actually procured and used in the vehicle. So if you see um, either of those, you, hopefully now you'll understand what they mean. Uh, acquisition and disposal dates are new, um, maybe not new as far as, uh, again, an agency capturing them, but uh, reporting them to FAST is something uh, different with vehicle level data. And there may be other uh, fields in FAST that are required now that uh, you may or not may or may not have had in your systems before. Next slide, please. So th there are some advantages to vehicle level reporting. Uh, as I mentioned before, the uh, in previous version or upload to FAST, you'd have to upload separately different fleets, foreign and domestic acquisitions, inventory, and so on. Uh, in this case, in VLD, you can load all of that all at the same time in one upload. So it's simpler to do. Uh, you can do system-to-system -system upload through XML, uh, as well as uh, uploading your information from an Excel spreadsheet. Certainly, the VLD rules, which we'll talk a little bit more about later, uh, improve data completeness and accuracy. It enhances your analytic capabilities because it includes more data points or more data elements that can be used to analyze your fleet information. And then, of course, the data elements and business rules are clearly defined and uniformly published in VLD, where in the previous version, um, some of the business rules were not so much on the surface. They were a little, uh, a little tougher to get a handle on. You had to learn the hard way in a lot of cases. Next slide, please. So there are lots of resources that uh, the FAST administrators make available to help you with understanding vehicle level data submissions. First and foremost is the data element reference. That is uh, what is referred to in the IT field as a data dictionary. It defines each of the fields that are in the system. 
the business rules reference will uh, enumerate each rule that is related to a specific data element, and generally there are four or five rules for each data element. Uh, there's a cost reporting decision tree available. That helps agencies classify their cost to help them pigeonhole or put their costs in correct cost buckets. Um, so it helps you decide when you have a cost where to put it. And that's really very important, particularly if you get into um, determining, uh, let's say, an optimal replacement cycle. You're doing an analysis to determine when it's the best time to replace the vehicle based on its cost and utilization, its depreciation, and so on and so forth. So correctly putting costs on the, the, the capital curve and the maintenance curve, classifying those costs correctly helps you more accurately determine a replacement, uh, an optimal replacement point. Uh, the VLD import template, of course, is available, and they have a section of frequently asked questions. Uh, if you download this presentation later on, that link uh, that you see on screen will take you directly to the uh, resource page for VLD information. Next slide, please. So here's an example from the data element reference and the business rule reference. I've chosen the acquisition date. You can see it's identifier OW-1 acquisition date. It's date type. Data type is date. And then it's description, year, month, day, when the agency initially assumed physical control or ownership of the vehicle. And then in bold, I've bolded this for a reason. This vehicle reported acquisition date must not change if the vehicle is transferred between subordinate organizations within a reporting agency. That sounds suspiciously like a rule, and in fact it is. Uh, below, you see the business rules reference, uh, the four rules that apply to that one particular field acquisition date. Uh, so it has to be in a date format, it must be a valid date prior to the end of the reporting year for which the date is being submitted, and then you have two more rules. But none of those rules specifically state the, the sentence that I have out, uh, bolded above. That statement above is actually enforced by a different rule for a different data element. So we, we may talk about, a little bit more about that later, but the, the point I want to make here is that there, the rules not only apply to a specific data element, but there are times when the rules are applicable to the relationship between that element and another data element. Um, so we'll see if we get the chance to where I can explain that further. But just understand that the rules apply to the data elements and the relationships between them. The other thing I want to point out on this slide is there over here on the right hand side in the class column is uh, there are two types of rules, blocking rules and flagging rules. Next slide, please. So when you're dealing with vehicle level data and, and trying to prepare your information for a fast submission, I, I want to suggest to you that it's a good thing to submit your compile your information and submit it to the FAST sandbox so that you can get error reports. The sandbox is an exact copy of the, of the production version of FAST. And so you can submit your information in the, the sandbox, get the error reports, and it will show you, the error reports will define for you or show you where you have bad data. Um, and it'll define why that data is bad according to each one of the rules that I, I showed you earlier. So blocking errors will prevent FAST from accepting the entire data file. So the blocking errors are focused on acceptability. And again, let me say that again. Blocking errors pre prevent the entire file from being accepted, not just the line of the vehicle that produced the error. It blocks the entire file. So all blocking errors have to be uh, cleared up before your data is acceptable or will be accepted into the uh, FAST system. 
Flagging errors, on the other hand, uh, will likely exist. Uh, you probably will never be able to get rid of all of them because there may be situations in your fleet that are outside the norm and would therefore probably produce a flag, but they would still be reasonable based on the specific situation in which you find that vehicle. Uh, again, flagging errors are, are kind of focused on the reasonability of data, whereas blocking errors are about the acceptability of data. And there I say that some rules define inter interdependencies between data elements. The FAST administrators are working to ensure, and my screen just went to sleep on me, sorry about that. Wow, it just went to sleep completely. Sorry, folks. Let's sign back in. So, FAST administrators are working to ensure only legitimate outliers are being identified by the flagging rules. And in the future, they may elevate some of the flagging rules to a blocking status. They are also considering alterations to the business rule implementation so that vehicles that have been in the fleet for a short period of time may not be subject to the reasonability thresholds. And what they mean, or what I mean by that, is to say that uh, any vehicle that's in the fleet for even one day has to be reported, whether it was disposed on the first day or acquired on the last day. It still has to be reported. Any vehicle that's in the fleet that short period of time, it would be unreasonable to expect it to have uh, an average sort of usage. So they're implementing those flagging rules uh, differently based on, on the data that's submitted. The point that I really want to make is that you should be on the lookout for future business rule changes. So you can check that FAST Help website and find the business rules and the data element reference, uh, uh, current copies of those as you need them. Uh, and it would be good to, uh, before you get too deep into the year, to kind of check that out. The last um, time they uh, published uh, information was in August. So again, this summer, I would expect them probably put out some more changes based on this past year's submission. Uh, next slide, please. So if, if this is your first go around with trying to, and there are some agencies that have not made the jump to vehicle level data yet, if you're one of those or working for one of those agencies, uh, you're going to be looking for sources of correct information. And first and foremost, the, the vehicle itself and its originating documents are, are the best sources of information. Uh, the originating documents being the certificate of origin or title, the CO or certificate of origin is uh, a preferred document as far as I'm concerned that comes generally from the manufacturer or a contractor for the manufacturer. Titling that's done by a state uh, can sometimes produce a mistake. Uh, it's rare, but it does happen. And generally, you can find a vehicle identification number, the VIN, you're making a model of gross weight on a CO. The manufacturer's window sticker is another uh, a great source of information that's often overlooked by a lot of people. It is required by federal law, so it should be on a new vehicle that's delivered to you. It contains vehicle attributes such as the VIN, your make and model, engine, transmission, fuel types, and the fuel types will help you determine what uh, fuel type configuration you'll be using in reporting to FAST. Always there is the standard and optional equipment, the destination market, whether it's built for U.S. sale or foreign, uh, and that's important for some of the uh, uh, emissions-related regulations and reporting, the ESA 141 designation. You also get warranty information, safety ratings, EPA fuel economy information, GHG scores, and CO2 grams per mile. All of that last line there is, again, related to uh, meeting federal regulations, particularly for domestic vehicles. Uh, if you can't scan this document and attach it to your asset records, I would suggest maybe taking a picture of it with your smartphone and upload information that, that way. Also, the federal safety certification label contains the VIN, a VIN barcode, 
GVW and tire pressures. And this is a label that's in the driver's door jam where your tire pressures are. Uh, again, and taking a picture of that's a pretty good idea. Uh, there is also software that you can, uh, an app that you can pull down or several apps you can pull down onto your smartphone that will help you read the VIN by, through the barcode, the barcode itself. And it may sound like that that's overkill, but a VIN is a very difficult thing to type correctly. Um, I have seen error rates on VIN numbers as high as 10%. And most organizations, even ones that are conscientious about their data, will have error rates uh, between 1% and 2% on VIN numbers. So scanning a barcode, getting it, with, and in, in, inputting it into your systems without touching the keyboard, uh, copying and pasting is certainly a way to get the VIN correct. And I would suggest doing that if you have the opportunity or anytime you have the opportunity to copy and paste a VIN, you should. Next slide, please. So resources for data cleanup. Uh, the data element reference and the business rules is our resource that you can use. Uh, the rules will def um, provide defined lists and will show you where you can use default values. Uh, another place to find information is the federal vehicle standards that are uh, publicly available from GSA website. And there you have the link. Uh, you can go back and look at vehicle information uh, for vehicles that have been acquired through GSA back to 2009. And so you can find their minimum standards. It won't necessarily be exact for a particular vehicle, but it will give you minimum standards. So you will be able to see exactly what year, make, model, how it's spelled, uh, what's used, what fuel types are being used. Uh, at some level, you'll be able to get some weight uh, occasionally. Uh, but again, it's, it's, uh, it's a place to go to get some information. The National Highway Transportation Safety Administration has available online a VIN decoder where you can take a VIN, copy it from your asset system or documentation and paste it in and click a button and get as many as 131 columns of data back. And most of the time you get 20, 25 different data elements related to a vehicle, but that information does originate with the manufacturer. So there's a high degree of, of correctness with that information. You can also uh, do VIN, VIN decoding in batches, and there you have also a link to that. You can drop in a text-based list of VIN numbers and get back a spreadsheet uh, by VIN, and uh, that's uh, very helpful if you're working on a large number of vehicles, uh, particularly when it's, uh, again, a domestic fleet where most vehicles are all vehicles that have been procured through GSA, you're going to be looking at domestic uh, makes and models generally, and the information that comes back is pretty complete on the domestic. So it's very helpful. Uh, it also will give you information on common U.S. imports as well, like uh, Toyota, Honda, Nissan, and so on. Uh, it, it will help you fill in the blanks on a lot of the VLD uh, attributes. And again, the manufacturer's window sticker is a great place if you don't have it, there are uh, a few manufacturers that are represented for a few years on windowstickerlookup.com. So it's another resource, not an end all, but just another place to go um, for some manufacturer produced information. Next slide, please. So cleanup strategies. Once you've got your data sources and the information to work with uh, and you start to do cleanup, I would highly recommend submitting your data on a regular basis to the FAST sandbox. Don't do all of your error correction first and then submit it to see how well you did. I would recommend that you work essentially from left to right to clean up the, uh, the data in the order in which the fields are listed in the data element reference. The reason behind that is, again, that interdependency between data elements. 
you can in fact have a, a all of the information correct except the fourth or fifth item in the list and that one item being wrong may cause four, five, or six errors down the line. When you correct that one item, you may very well either cause or clean up subsequent errors. So it's best really to, to kind of work from left to right in, in terms of um, the way the uh, data elements are listed in the upload template or in the data element reference. Uh, so again, I would suggest that you do that as you, as you clean up a column in your uh, data set, then resubmit it and get a fresh set of blocking errors back from uh, the FAST system so you can see where you are. Uh, as you're cleaning up data, if you're doing this in an Excel spreadsheet, for instance, I would sort your data by VIN number. This has a tendency to group vehicles by year, make, and model, which makes uh, the facility in Excel of auto repeat very helpful, makes you a lot more efficient when you've got a number of vehicles that say were added into your system as Chevrolets, but the, the, the people that put it in, put it in as Chevy instead of spelling out Chevrolet. Uh, and again, the data rules when uh, will, will tell you that Chevrolet needs to be spelled correctly and it also has to be in capital letters. So you can't submit it as a lowercase Chevrolet. So the rules are very specific and they need to be followed with, uh, carefully followed to get your submission. And again, correcting uh, Chevrolet, which can be done four or five different ways, uh, correcting it to a single value is pretty quick when you can use that auto repeat functionality. Again, use your GSA and Vindy code data uh, as a lookup uh, for information. I say GSA data because there are, it's not unusual for agencies to have both agency owned and leased vehicles. And if you have a significant number of vehicles in both categories, you're gonna have your leased vehicle information in GSA drive-through and probably have your owned information either in FedFMS or in an asset system or fleet management system within your organization. And so you can use the GSA information to look up as a lookup because it's more than likely going to be correct as a lookup to help you with your own vehicle information. And there again, I, I restate, please, you know, please do yourself a favor and submit that information to the sandbox on a regular basis as you're doing your corrections and measure your progress as you go. We'll talk a little bit more about that here in a few minutes. But that's a, these are strategies that you can use and places you can find information. And when you finally get to the point where you've got uh, all your blocks cleared, uh, I would suggest <laughs> celebrating that because it can be on the first go around, it can be daunting. Uh, the first time I bounced a large file off of the fast sandbox, I got back something in the order of 80,000 uh, errors. So it can be quite a task, uh, depending, of course, on what your data is like and how many vehicles you have. Also note there that flagging errors are not, uh, flagging error report is not produced from FAST until the blocking errors are cleared. Um, I would also suggest that you, when you get close to the end of your blocking errors, don't wait until you get them all cleared because the last you sometimes can be problematic. You can't get responses from the field or whatever support you need you're having trouble with, and it can take a lot of time. So rather than ignore the flagging errors until everything is cleaned up, I would suggest stripping out the vehicles that have known blocking errors from your file and submit what you know then would be acceptable, and you'll get a head start at looking at your flagging errors. You're not gonna have generally as many flagging errors as you do blocking errors, but uh, it's still a good idea to get a look at them and see what kinds of issues you may yet be dealing with. Next slide, please. So you've got a successful submission or a file that, that it fast will accept, but there's still a problem and, and, and you know, you're not really done at that point. You've got new vehicle acquisitions coming into your 
into your fleet information system because you're generally constantly replacing vehicles. And new fleet data means new VLD errors. So you, you may have cleaned up your information and for fiscal 18 or 19, whatever you're working on, but the information that continues to come into your asset systems and fleet information systems may still be loaded with errors. So let's talk about some ways that we can uh, cut down on that. Next slide, please. Fleet da data collection for uh, VLD or, or for your information, uh, for your information systems can come in in several different places. It may, your information may come from or through GSA. It may come uh, uh, originate in a procurement system. It may originate in an asset system, a fleet management system. Some of the data may be duplicated or originate in a fuel site control system or a fuel card, bank card system. There's lots of different places where the VLD data elements originate. And the, the point I'm trying to raise here is you need to figure out where that information originates in, within the web of information systems that your agency uses and where those data points can be edited throughout that web of systems. And make sure, if you can, work with your IPT, IT people to make sure that the proper database constraints and validation rules exist to control or keep out bad data. Because ultimately, that information has to be corrected before it goes into FAST. And then at the end, GSA will report a, on it uh, publicly through the Federal Fleet Report. So uh, the, the point is to get some friends in your IT group and get them to help you make changes according to the rules, the business rules, in your information systems to stop the production of bad data where it first originates in the system. Next slide, please. So validate data elements at their point of origin. That's what I was just talking about. Update your systems where, where this can occur. Align your fleet policy with the data element definitions in the DER and the cost decision tree. Again, the, like the acquisition date needs to, to be represented correctly. So it needs to be uh, representative of when you actually took physical control of the vehicle. And you do need to classify your costs correctly so that when you are compared to other agencies in the end Federal Fleet Report, you get an, uh, a fair comparison. You should be providing uh, uh, guidance documents and training to the personnel that are responsible for fleet data entry. Uh, again, compile and upload the VLD information into the fan, FAST sandbox, but do it periodically in a proactive fashion during the course of this year ahead of the FAST season, which will be after November 30 this year in the latter in the last quarter. So that's when we're having to work on and submit that information. But what I'm telling you is that you can work on that information now. There's no reason that you can't compile a VLD file, throw it against the sandbox, get the errors back, and start to work on those errors now. Certainly make it much less stressful and a lot easier later in the year when we're really actually working towards a, 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 the the uh, official submission. Also use the FAST data quality and consistency report to evaluate your information once it's accepted into uh, the system. So once you get all your blocking errors, you have your flagging error report, you can also go to the DQCR and look at, uh, that'll give you another way of, of seeing where there may be issues in your data. And then finally, create some metrics. Keep track of your blocking errors and, and seeing them reduce as you're working on them, that'll help motivate you to move forward. And it also, uh, if you're passing that information along to your leadership, they'll understand that your, your work is producing results. And you can, in some cases, forecast where you are or where you think you're going to be. Uh, that can help you get help if you need it. Uh, that's another reason to get a look at your flagging errors you know, before it gets too late. Uh, while you have the leadership's um, 
attention on the blocking errors, you can start to throw the flagging errors and again get more help if need be or, or get changes made in procedural documents or processes or uh, your IT systems that again would help you reduce these errors and reduce the workload in the long run. So the metrics, it might sound like a little extra work, but they can be used to your advantage, uh, particularly in, in motivating you and uh, also in giving you or helping you get resources if you need them and support. Next slide, please. So, finished there with metrics, talking about metrics for VLD cleanup. Um, and we'll start into a discussion about metrics, but I think it would be good at this point to see if anybody has any questions up to this point. We'll give you just a, a bit to type anything in if you need to. Okay, not seeing anything, that's good. So we'll move on. Uh, uh, fleet data metrics, what is a metric? A metric is a process of developing objective data to measure how your fleet is doing. Notice I did not say it's a number. It's frequently expressed in a number, but it's a process. So by saying that, I'm saying that the information that you put into your system winds up being the source and makeup of a number, a metric. So the, the metric is what you see in the end result, that number that you're looking at is an end result of a process of implementing or putting information in and applying a, an algorithm or a formula or what have you to get a number that represents a specific or relates to a specific fleet management goal. So a metric is a process, not just a number. It is quantifiable and a quantifiable and repeatable standard of measurement and metrics can be used to develop benchmarks, which is a standard by which progress can be measured. So benchmarks can be very helpful, obviously, in, in stating exactly what your goal is, uh, whether it's um, reaching a certain number of uh, disposals uh, to reduce your fleet size, you would want to count your disposals, and, and if you have a goal of 400 disposals, and you count your way to that, the, the benchmark would be 400. Uh, in some cases, benchmarks that are a long way away from where you want to be, or sometimes can be disheartening to the staff. So uh, I like to use sometimes the benchmark as a point of departure to say, we're here now, and we want to move upward in this direction. Uh, and once you've departed from that departure point a good ways, uh, people can see and feel the, the positive aspect of that. Then you set your goal, your other benchmark is this is where we're headed. Let's try and reach that. We're making great progress moving in that direction. Now let's reach up to this line. So benchmarks, I think, can be used in both ways as a point of departure and a goal. Next slide, please. So a good metric is clearly defined and easily understood. It's timely. It means something today. It it's, comes from information that was recently produced. So it gives you a, 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 an understanding of what's happening very recently. What, where are we going with that? Indicates how well goals and objectives are being met. Helps you ask the right questions about your performance. If you see if you're looking at a, a vehicle availability statistic that says that, that your vehicles are available 90% of the time, uh, in, in the real world, 90% is a pretty low number as far as availability is concerned. Uh, most fleets can reach 95% if it's a mixed fleet of light and heavy duty vehicles. If you have a light duty fleet, most fleets are going to operate 98% or above if they're replacing vehicles properly and doing good maintenance. Uh, so um, if you had a highly, uh, a most mostly light fleet, a light vehicle fleet, then you'd want to see your, your availability at 90, 98% above. If you get a number that's 90 or below 95, you're going to be asking yourself, why is it like that? Where is all this downtime coming from? So. It, 
a good metric is going to prompt the right kind of question. Good metrics will eliminate speculation. There won't be any guesswork involved. It will allow, if your metrics are clearly defined and thoroughly defined, you can do comparisons, apples to apples comparisons to other organizations that are using the same sorts of algorithms and formula. And you should, as I mentioned earlier with the, the uh, DLD statistics or error rates, you should be using those statistics to communicate to leadership, customers, and fleet staff where appropriate. Next slide, please. So where do you begin with, with metrics? A good place to begin is by looking at the end. The Federal Fleet Report is compiled in a Federal Fleet Inventory tool online, and you can go to that tool and see what GS say and the FAST administrators do with the FAST data. You will be able to see where your agency or how your agency is compared to other agencies to see what your um, performance is like in comparison to other agencies. On the left side, you'll see that's a drop down essentially from the title page and it gives you all of those different tabs. There are different metrics on each tab. So, this is kind of like getting to see the final exam before you have to take it. So it, the advantage is this is, is understanding how you're going to be evaluated in the end, what the public is going to see, what Congress is going to see uh, about your agency's efforts to manage the fleet properly. So I would start here. These are statistics that are produced from your uh, information that can help you uh, determine which of these metrics are meaningful to you and which you might want to start to produce in-house periodically throughout the year to help motivate and track your progress and improvement. Next slide, please. The Fast Data Quality and Consistency Report, I mentioned that earlier. I'm not going to talk about all of these different uh, metrics that are on the report, but I want you to see how many there are. So, you know, you've got inventory things, uh, acquisitions and disposals, fuel consumption, et cetera, down the line. So the DQCR is a report that includes a number of valuable metrics. Uh, again, this is a way that, that these metrics are already produced. Uh, it'll be based on the information you submit. You can uh, submit a trial uh, file to the sandbox, and if it's doesn't have any blocking errors, then you can run this DQCR and see what it looks like in comparison to information that was loaded in past years. So you get trend analysis on each one of the metrics that are listed here. So that's another way to start to look at your own information and to understand how other folks are looking at your information. Next slide, please. Here are the, the, the other half, so to speak, of the DQCR. There are data consistency tables that will show you uh, vehicle inventory versus fuel cost and consumption by ownership and fuel type, inventory versus miles, inventory versus operating cost, inventory versus cost per mile and con fuel consumption, and then the ESA 141 uh, designation. Uh, that's, uh, you know, your compliance with the, that act, the, the Energy um, Independence and Security Act of 2007. Next slide, please. So here's an example from the DQCR. In this case, you're seeing on the left column here, vehicle type, the, the vehicle fleet is broken down in these eight different categories, sedans, low-speed electric vehicles, ambulance, buses, etc. And then the subsequent columns, 2013, 14, 15 through 17, and totals at the bottom. In the far right column, in the 2017 column, you see two cells that are highlighted. That's the light-duty truck 4x4, or light-duty truck 4x2, I'm sorry, and medium-duty vehicle. Those cells are highlighted because there's a significant change between that number and the previous year. In the light duty 4 by 2 you can see it went from 1,900 vehicles to 2,500, almost 2,600 vehicles. So that's a 650 vehicle change there. In the next box down, or the next pairing down, which is not highlighted, and I don't know why, because it also is a very significant change, 
you can see uh, it went from 2,700 vehicles to 4,000. So that's a 1,300 vehicle change. And the next line down is from 5,600 down to 4,000. So 1,600 vehicle change. Now, you have to ask yourself, did this fleet actually purchase that many vehicles and dispose of that many vehicles to modify, modify its fleet makeup? The answer to that question is no. They didn't go out and buy 4,000 vehicles and change the makeup of their fleet. This is 2017. This is the first year of a VLD submission. The data cleanup that went on in relationship to adding VIN numbers and then correctly classifying the vehicles by vehicle type, light duty and medium duty, according to those gross vehicle weights, changed a lot of values. There was a lot of incorrect classification. And after it was corrected, you get a much cleaner look at a much more truthful look at how many vehicles fall into each class. So two points about this. One, there can be a lot of this kind of work out there if your data hasn't been cleaned yet. Two, uh, the data cleanup makes a big difference in the accuracy of the data that's being presented to you and others through and by the FAST system and the Federal Fleet Report. Uh, and just as an, a side note, any of these sorts of highlighted fields in the DQCR should be addressed or talked about in a fleet management plan, which is uh, most of you probably have heard about that. And these, it's another submission that has to go into FAST on an annual basis. Next slide, please. So categories of measurement. There are different ways uh, of, or places where you really need to have metrics when you're uh, quantifying fleet activity correctly. The inventory, of course, you want to know how many vehicles you have. Uh, but there should also be two other metrics. You should be looking at how many vehicles are you acquiring, because every single vehicle you acquire is uh, will push your number of vehicles up. You should be looking at the number of disposals you're producing each year. Every disposal will reduce that inventory number, of course. And what, what's really important in my mind is the disposals. The fastest way for fleets to get out of hand is for them to fail to dispose of vehicles on time. That's sometimes rather conveniently done. Oh, we forgot to do it and we've been using it. Uh, we really need it, so let's keep it. And that's kind of the excuse you hear on the phone uh, when you call and, and call somebody on the carpet about not getting rid of vehicles that were earmarked for disposal. So a, a disposal metric and, and doing follow-up on planned disposals or actions I would highly recommend, particularly in light of uh, vehicle allocation methodology or VAM studies that are done periodically on federal fleets, uh, another re regulatory requirement. Uh, most VAM studies will produce uh, optimal fleet profiles that are smaller than what their current inventory is. So most fleets, when they do a VAM, have a goal of reducing their number of fleet vehicles and tracking disposals is the quickest and cleanest way to help make sure that happens, or at least to make sure that the fleet creep or fleet growth doesn't happen while you're not looking. So you should be monitoring all your cost types, including quantities, uh, acquisitions we just talked about, leases, fuel and maintenance, costs and fuel quantities, accident costs, disposal costs and proceeds, and the indirect costs. Uh, utilization, of course, you're going to be watching your miles traveled for vehicles, but you, if you're going to measure utilization, particularly in relationship to a VAM, uh, you should also be measuring the number of trips and, and the number of hours that vehicles are being used. There are times when a vehicle might only be used once a day to go out to a location and come back. It might very well be a pretty short distance, but it could be that the vehicle is, in fact, in use all day long and unavailable for anyone else. A good example of that would be a plumber or some other tradesman going to a work site using his vehicle, his or her vehicle, as a platform to work from with materials and tools and equipment. Uh, so that vehicle is in use all day long. 
and measuring utilization by hours will help justify that vehicle much more clearly than measuring it in trips or miles. So it's important to get a good, clear, comprehensive picture of vehicle utilization by using all three of those metrics. Um, certainly, if you have the data to support it, you should be looking at it that way. Uh, regulatory compl compliance, of course, is uh, very important for domestic uh, fleets, alternative fuel vehicle acquisitions, uh, your 701 waivers and so on. Uh, if you have in-house maintenance function, functions, then that opens up a whole myriad of different kinds of metrics that should be used to um, monitor your maintenance to make sure that it's being applied effectively and efficiently. I've listed some there, fleet availability, mechanics productivity, scheduled or unscheduled labor. Uh, it, you'll if you're doing in-house maintenance, you also have an inventory of repair parts and the inventory turn rate and demand fill rate are uh, critical measurements for that sort of supply uh, function. Fleet operations also uh, need to be looked at. Uh, certainly your utilization metrics will help you with some of that, but you should also be counting home to work authorizations you want to keep a lid on that because that can be a real uh, political nightmare for you if you're not careful. So you want to make sure that each authorization is, um, you know, signed off on appropriately, and that you don't uh, one year have 20 of them and the next year have 50. Uh, so you definitely want to keep an eye on that. Motor pool vehicle utilization rates. Uh, it's very important to make sure that you have motor pools. To uh, make sure those vehicles are utilized a very high percentage of the time. You don't want your motor pools too large. Uh, and so you want to see 85, 90, 95 percent utilization rates. And if you have demand above that, fill it in with uh, rentals from Budget or Avis or whoever. Uh, you don't want to have enough pool vehicles to sa satisfy the peaks. You want to have enough pool vehicles to satisfy the valleys and work from someone else's owned stock to do the rest of your, your pool work. Ridership is an important metric, particularly if you're uh, in the business of, of transporting large numbers of people on shuttles or uh, in support of or doing some sort of public transportation. Assignment types, how many vehicles are assigned to individuals versus being in a pool or shared by multiple offices. Kind of similar to home to work authorizations, you want to keep those dedicated to uh, individually assigned vehicles to a minimum as much as possible. Uh, and share vehicles to keep the utilization up, keeping utilization up um, certainly uh, makes the justification for having the vehicle a lot easier. Next slide, please. So metric design, I wanted to kind of give you a sense of uh, one way to go about looking at a metric and seeing what your options are. In this use case, we're looking at a cost per mile metric. So we've got a cost type, and I'm looking in the center column here. Uh, you've got a cost type divided by miles traveled. So your cost options on the right-hand side or acquisition cost, lease cost, maintenance, fuel, accidents, et cetera. So you could take any one of those and produce a metric out of that, or you could combine fuel and maintenance, combine lease and acquisition to look at your capital cost versus a miles traveled. Your maintenance operation, uh, I'm sorry, your capital would be acquisition, lease, disposal, and disposal proceeds to determine what your total capital load is. Uh, maintenance, fuel, accident, those sorts of things, you, you can mix and match as you need to to get a metric that helps you look at whatever it is you're trying to influence in your fleet operations. On the left-hand column, you've got major data groups, and these are all data elements that are now available through VLD. The vehicle type or classification, a location, so that might be an office or a physical location, you're, you're generally reporting a physical location in VLD through a zip code or a lat long, but that can correspond to an office, uh, a business unit. 
So those sorts of groupings may very well tell you things, particularly when you're compare, comparing one location to another, uh, particularly if the mission for those locations is very similar. Uh, law enforcement and emergency response designations, grouping those together is uh, good because those are specialized services um, and that generally produce very different metrics from standard types of missions. Uh, standard pool use is very different from a tri fire truck or an ambulance or a police car, so the metrics would look very different, and, and you'd want to break them out separately. Uh, if you put agency sort information into your VLD file, it's not required, but if you put it in, it gives you the opportunity to use it. An armored designation, certainly you would not want to compare armored vehicles to non-armored vehicles. The, the costs are wildly different. Uh, ownership type, fuel type configuration, assignment type, etc. So you can use one or more grouping and one or more cost option and in this with this table define several different ways of looking at one metric to help you look at different types of usages within your fleet. Cost per mile is a very commonly used metric, but it, in my estimation, it's most effectively used at the very top of an organization to see whether what the trend is like over time. Are we getting more efficient or not? And then at the very bottom of an organization to look at and compare transactional data. Uh, to find outliers, particularly, let's say, in fueling information, a vehicle that's over-reporting or under-reporting miles due to mileage errors will have cost per mile numbers that are way up or way below the norm for a particular group of vehicles. So it's uh, as cost per mile or CPM is great as far as finding outliers, uh, bad data indications, or uh, mileage errors or uh, bad reporting of fuel consumption. And, and again, as I said, a uh, cost per mile can be great as far as trend analysis for the overall organization. If you have a goal of improving the efficiency of your fleet using less fuel, uh, which translates into lower, lower greenhouse gas emissions, if that's one of your primary goals, then watching cost per mile at the executive level would be a good thing to do, aside from uh, watching the number of gallons of petroleum fuels versus alternative fuels consumed or GHGs in general. Next, <clears throat> excuse me, next slide, please. So some other common metrics uh, at total cost per vehicle, a cost type, and we would talk about those, The um, that was the right-hand column in the previous slide cost type per vehicle, fuel cost per gallon, miles per gallon, miles per vehicle, et cetera. Each one of those are uh, other common metrics that are used. The average age uh, gives you a sense if you calculate that by class, vehicle class or overall fleet gives you a sense over time of whether you're, if your fleet is getting older, then that means you're not replacing vehicles in a timely fashion or you're holding on to too many disposals and, and that's keeping your average age rising rather than getting those out and make your average age tell you the truth or be on target. An average age at disposal will help you understand what your um, effective replacement criteria is. You may have goals of replacing certain classifications at let's say seven years or 10 years, but if your average age at disposal for the group that's supposed to be or targeted at seven years is nine, then again, you uh, may have trouble with utilization to help justify the disposal. Uh, maybe you're not pooling enough or maybe you have too many vehicles on hand. Um, the, uh, it could be a funding issue. You, know, you haven't been able to get funding, so your fleet is aging. Um, but again, it, you know, the, that metric will help you see how you're doing in, in relationship to your stated goals. Next slide, please. So that's pretty much the end of the content. If, you, if you're interested by what you saw, 
certainly you can learn a lot more about fleet management through the MPMA Certified Federal Fleet Management Pro Training Program. There's the CFFS Specialist Administrator and Manager Levels, and those are the basic topics that we cover in our, in our training. Um, each sub uh, bullet there is a full day of instruction on each one of those topics, so it is a lot to cover. Uh, and if you're not a fleet specialist, I wouldn't jump into it and assume that it would be easy. It's not. Um, if you're a, a seasoned fleet manager that's been around a long time, you'll be able to cruise through it pretty easily. But uh, just be aware that whoever's coming into those, you should read the materials before you get to the class. There's a lot of content, and, and like this, we have to move fairly quickly to get through it all. Next slide, please. And here are some uh, upcoming training events. The CFFS in February, probably a little late to uh, try to get in that. You've got April, which is uh, around the uh, Washington Auto Show and Fed Fleet in, in April, May, and July. The July date is in Naples, Italy. Uh, the May date is in Denver. So we're working at trying to make these uh, training events available in different places, uh, nationally and internationally as well, because we have a lot of customers uh, that uh, operate international fleets. Uh, the military, the State Department um, operate internationally, so we're working to try and make it easier for folks to make these events. And at the bottom there is the, the uh, a link to uh, the calendar of events on the NPMA webpage where you can find out more information. There are a lot, several other dates that we have set up for this year. And I think we're done. There might be another slide, maybe. Okay, probably not. Nope, that's it. But we'll entertain questions if there are any at this point. And thank you very much for your time and attention. Thanks, Kent. That was a great presentation. Um, looking at the list here, I'm currently not seeing any questions um, posted at this moment. If anybody has any, please feel free. Oop, I see one. Hold on. Oop, it was more of a comment. Um, uh, Thanks so much and appreciate the metrics calculation example. So great job, Ken. Um, let's see. Oops. Oh, I have one more comment um, that there's still lots of slots open um, for the training that's in um, Cocoa Beach in February. So anybody's interested in participating in that, you can still sign up. Let's see. I do have one question. Oh, uh, more administrative, Kent, sorry. Um, relative to CEUs. Um, so, um, we will um, post um, CEUs for this class or for the webinar. Um, if there's anybody on the line um, that's in a group setting list listening to the webinar today um, that are MPMA members, um, you can send me um, their names and emails and we can get them CEU credits as well for um, being an MPMA member. I think that's all the questions or comments I am seeing, though, at the moment. Um, also, um, the webinar will be posted up on to the YouTube. Um, the slides, um, I had a question about the slides, if they will be downloaded, um, Kent, if we are able um, to. Um, we can post the presentation slides, um, but we can work through that and get them posted up on the link afterwards. So, 
And one more question, this is for you, Kent. Um, what is your email address if people had questions? Uh, you can send me uh, email at K Carneal, that's C A R N E A L, at Mercury, M E R U R Y, dash A S S O C dot com. K Carneal at Mercury dash Associates, A S S O C dot com. Okay, perfect. Thank you everybody for attending. Uh, I hope you have a great rest of your day. Um, the next um, webinar, uh, our last one for the month, uh, will be next week um, on the 29th. So hope to see you then.